what he really did was take away the restrictions and confinements of stiffer styles that had gone before it. He made it appropriate in the workplace for women to wear trouser suits. He made men feel sophisticated and perfectly tailored. Changes in menswear happen incredibly rarely. You have the rise of America in the early 20th century and that changed menswear. You had the Industrial Revolution in the 19th and that changed menswear. And what Armani did in the 70s changed menswear as well and it's affected the way that every suit in the world is made. Giorgio Armani was born in, in Piacenza in northern Italy in 1934. You do get a sense when he's talked about his upbringing that the war was very evident. There's a, a story that he and one of his friends were playing with um, an unexploded shell in the streets and the, the shell went off, it killed his friend and it severely burnt Armani. Armani's family were a middle-class family and, like others, during the Second World War suffered great hardship financially and Armani has said that, you know, even finding food was difficult at this period of time. After the war um, and after studying medicine and being in the army, Armani went to work um, for a Milanese department store. He always said that that, for him, was his introduction to kind of knowing about fabric, but more importantly, it was an introduction to customers. This was a really extraordinary step because it was a very forward-thinking, pioneering store, and he had suddenly access to really creative, extraordinary people. And he rose through the ranks very, very quickly. So he started doing um, buying um, soon after joining, which I think is a very interesting kind of career path because extraordinary from others who have either other designers who have learnt their craft from their mothers, or have um, studied in a sort of art school um, setting. He really didn't. He studied on the department store floor. There's lots of pictures of him from around then, and he was always kind of incredibly well presented. He was a very precise child. When he wound up meeting Nino Ciruti, um, who offered him his first kind of fashion job after working at the department store, um, Ciruti's first comment to him was that he looked respectable and then he tossed a bunch of fabrics across to him and asked Armani to pick his favourites. And Armani said it was lucky that he picked the same favourites as Chiruti, and that's why Chiruti took him on as, as kind of part of his company. The first thing that Chiruti did when Armani started there was, was send him to the, the textile mills that Chiruti still owns and operates um, to look at how cloth was made. And Armani said, really, at that point, there, there was that kind of imbued a, a certain passion for textile in him, the fact that he was able to see how, how fabric was constructed, um, able to experiment with, it, with a huge variety of fabrics. Obviously, as a, as a designer, um, that's something that's proved incredibly important. It's something that he's still known for now, his use of textile um, in tailoring and how he's, he was able to kind of soften tailoring and revolutionise it by using all, all the fabrics that he was introduced to under his, under his work at Chiruti. Ceruti has a very similar aesthetic to what Armani then went on to in his own brand. Ceruti had this really extraordinary way of using different fabrics to tailor menswear. And so Armani ended up working on Ceruti's menswear line called Hitman. And this is a really, really exciting period of time where he kind of gained a language from being mentored by Ceruti. Really, that whole way that the Beatles looked, the way that all of the mods looked in the 60s, was Italian tailoring. And, and that was all based on these kind of very neat, very precise, very tight cuts. And that was only possible through these incredibly fine fabrics and new kind of techniques of tailoring. Towards the end of the 60s, Armani met Sergio Galeotti, which marked the beginning of a personal and professional relationship. Sergio Galeotti um, was a, a friend of Armani, he became Armani's lover, um, but he was also the person that really um, encouraged Armani to break out on his own. He said to Armani, why are you designing these wonderful clothes for all these other people? Why aren't you designing them for yourself? Why aren't you doing it under your own name? And this spurred on Armani to take contracts as a freelancer, so designing for a range of different designers. And I think that that sets him on the path that we now associate with him. 
really it was off the back of all of this freelance and the, the money that Armani had made from his freelance work and actually from selling his car. Him and um, Galeotti sold the Volkswagen that they owned together to get seed capital of $10,000 to, to start their own company. There was only one table that Armani would be drawing on one side and Galeotti would be trying to work out the business on the other side. You know, it was, it was an incredibly small company. Don Mello actually said in one of his early collections that the lighting was so bad, Armani ended up getting up and taking the shade off the lamp so, they could, so it was a bare bulb so she could see the colours of the clothes better. And she bought the collection because what Armani did at that time was to, in, in very broad terms, to soften menswear into harden women's wear. The first line, Spring Summer 1976, was really all about celebrating this craft of suppler lines, slightly wider trouser legs um, in really, really delectable fabrics. So it was really quite fresh, but in a very kind of refined way. This whole idea of adding a certain sensuality and softness to men's suits and creating something that chimed with this kind of wave of femininity that was then um, affecting society as a whole, but actually not affecting high fashion or, to a great degree. But what Armani did was to, to kind of work on perfecting um, a uniform for a new generation of working women. And in, in the 70s, that seemed revolutionary. And obviously, what it actually did was set the blueprint for the 80s. In 1978, Armani signed an agreement with clothes manufacturer GFT. In the history of the company, GFT gave them financial backing. And this was really integral because it meant that their production and textile manufacture was really, really supported. They had done extraordinarily well, turning over two million sales in, in, in just the first few years of, of being founded. In the same year, the same group made an agreement with Versace to manufacture his clothes as well. And really what that was seen as at, in fashion at the time was this rise of, of Milan as a competitor to Paris. And it was this rise of Italy as a commercial and a creative force in fashion, and a, a real challenge to the kind of supremacy of Paris at that period. In the United States, Armani's designs were received really very, very well. You know, GQ referred to it in the late 70s as the total look. In Armani coming to America in 1979, it's, it's notable that that was the first time his clothes were, were available in the country. And by the end of the 80s, Armani had become the biggest selling European designer in the whole of the United States. I think after the, the 70s, the, the 80s really became a, a decade that was about designers, um, more so actually than the clothes. The interesting thing with when you look at Armani's designs for women's wear, especially if you compare it to someone like Versace, he generally didn't make clothes that exuded femininity in the same way that Versace did. They weren't kind of clothes that were about women with enormous personalities. But for a lot of women, they, they found a certain comfort in that. They found that it was the way that they wanted to dress to feel confident, to feel secure, and to feel that they could compete in a man's world. It was a really extraordinary kind of marriage with these women looking for things to wear in, in, in this business corporate sense, but that really enhanced their elegance and their beauty, but were appropriate in terms of giving confidence and feeling strong and, and independent. The tailoring fabrics that were used were not the stiff and stuffy fabrics that had been used previously. They were soft and fluid. The first Armani SPA store in Milan was in 1983. Armani and Galeotto took their time to open this space. So really being super selective about the way in which they sold their garments. So really from the very beginning, it was one store in major cities that was selling just a very limited stock, which added to this exclusivity. Soon after, they opened on Madison Avenue in New York and then following with London. And I think these shops really kind of helped to make them a global brand, but it was all very considered. The 1980s started well for Armani as he continued to find new ways in which to showcase his brand to a worldwide audience. Kind of concurrently, strangely, the things that happened were he dressed 
Richard Gere for American Gigolo, he launched Emporio Armani and he launched Armani Perfume. In the early 80s, Armani partnered up with L'Oreal and created a line of fragrances. Um, this was very interesting in the sense that they were an extension of the brand, so more in terms of the total look that his clothes could create. Also, you're now playing into a scent that the Armani woman would wear. The interesting thing with Armani signing the agreement with L'Oreal is, is first of all, that L'Oreal um, don't sign these agreements very often. It was 20 years after Armani before they signed anyone new to, to collaborate with on a fragrance line. It's building this kind of idea that this is a lifestyle, but to fit in with the life that you already have. When they actually first approached Armani to, to dress American Gigolo, um, Armani said he would do it because he knew he was launching Emporio Armani and he knew the publicity that it would generate for him. So he knew he was launching a lower priced, more widely available brand, and he wanted to be able to capitalize on the publicity that, that the film would generate for him. I think it was something that really defined an era. American Gigolo became this kind of classic film where these suits worn by gear, it was just so perfect for the character. Armani really understanding exactly the way in which clothes can tell a narrative within this sphere of film. I think when you watch that film and you look at it, at times it's like an extended advert for Armani. You know, you look at the stills from it and they could be Armani advertising campaigns from the same time. Um, and today it seems sort of commonplace, but then it was, it was really unique, especially in menswear, to have that kind of vision presented cinematically. And then also to suddenly have a lower price line that you could buy into, a perfume line that you could buy into. Commercially, it was incredibly savvy to, to kind of capitalize on the publicity that was generated from that. Um, and I think that was probably what really established Armani's name in America. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Having found success with his work on American Gigolo, Armani continued to dress many of Hollywood's biggest films. After American Gigolo, Armani went on to design costumes for films, notably Batman, Pulp Fiction. But the real big hitter I think in terms of legacy was Miami Vice, which was a TV show, but really sort of defined the 80s in many ways. The costumes in themselves, unlike American Gigolo, where the costumes were absolutely the focus, the, co the costumes aren't especially remarkable. What I find remarkable is that they're, certainly the, the later incarnations of that are, for me, a reflection of, of Armani's relationship with Hollywood which in the late 80s and early 90s really blossomed into something beyond films. Armani became the first designer that was actively petitioning to dress people for the red carpet. At a time when no other fashion houses were doing that, he offered to dress them in high fashion that was desirable and low-key, which obviously is a major part of Armani's aesthetic, is the fact that it is quite subdued, it is elegant, it is low-key, it's minimalist, it's simple. And all of those things appeal to Hollywood stars. He is so intertwined with this kind of Oscar season dressing that is reported by, you know, far and wide and, and a real obsession in popular culture. When Sergio Galeotti died in, in 1985 of an AIDS-related illness, Armani kind of retreated into himself. The, the big impact it had on the company was that Armani didn't replace him. Um, Armani took on the mantle of financial responsibility and creative responsibility for his empire. You know, there is this whole sense that Armani doesn't have any children. I feel like Giorgio Armani as a company is, is kind of his baby. It's something that, you know, he cares for, he nurtures it, he looks after it. Um, and it's something that he wants to see succeed. And you can see that in, in terms of the, the turnover and the passion, the, the expansion of Armani, which continued all the way through the 90s and continues until today.
when we're looking at things like Armani Exchange, Armani Jeans, um, Emporio Armani, EA7, the sportswear line, it, it's again, it's about Armani diversifying. It's about a certain demand, I feel, for, for Armani's product and for Armani's name. There's a certain power to that name. In any other designer, it would be watering it down and it would affect the brand value. But with Armani, he's really able to do that. Armani Exchange really kind of rode this wave of kind of street culture and streetwear um, instead of perhaps creating it themselves. But I think it was, again, this kind of magnificent foresight to uh, design lines and ranges and items for everybody. For him, this real kind of synergy between all of these lines, there isn't one that is kind of the, the main focus of his attention. There isn't one that he rates higher than any of the others. He's involved in all of them. They, they have different characters. For instance, when you look at Armani Privé, which was the, is the Haute Couture collection he launched in early 2000, um, I feel there's a certain sort of eccentricity to that that you don't see in Armani's other endeavours. In, in a sense, I feel it's, it's about knowing your customer. It goes back to him at that department store. It's knowing what your customer demands at all these different levels and that an Oak Couture customer will demand something that's more unique, more singular. These are one-off dresses. The dress is handmade um, and there'll only be kind of a maximum of six of each design produced. So really, they're a venue for Armani to explore his creativity, but there's a reality to them, there's a market to them. And Armani Privé sells, like every aspect of the Armani empire, it makes commercial sense first and foremost. In the year 2000, there was a flurry of investments in the company, and these activities really contributed to consolidating the brand. This was a period when fashion conglomerates were buying up other labels at a voracious pace. Um, Gucci had bought into Yves Saint Laurent. So at, at that time, Armani seemed kind of prime either to be invested in by one of these large conglomerates or to become a conglomerate unto itself. So really what Armani decided to do, rather than take outside investment, was to, to expand internally, to take on licensees, to license things out, to really become kind of a conglomerate all under the Armani name. And really what I think Armani is, is a conglomerate that's composed of Armani labels and is, is controlled and designed by one man, and that's something that's quite extraordinary. In the year 2000, the Guggenheim Museum in New York hosted an exhibition of Armani's work. Armani um, being celebrated in an art institution really made people look at his work in a different light, maybe perhaps made Armani look at his work in a different light, but obviously it generated some controversy in terms of people questioning whether or not you could call fashion art. It was an absolutely ginormous exhibition, over 400 garments, which is really extraordinary. Exhibitions of this type range between the 100 to 200 pieces and he really enjoyed it because he got to show the more outlandish of his designs that weren't received so well by perhaps his customers and also the press. I think the interesting thing with, with Armani Casa is that it's very much a representation of the Armani aesthetic. Um, and the Armani aesthetic is very much a representation of its times. So the fact that the critics were incredibly enthusiastic about what Armani was doing for home design as well as what he was doing for fashion design um, is really kind of an indication of how tied he is with popular culture. If you look right back to very early on in his career, where American journalists for GQ to find his clothing as the total look. Here you're really getting this home, whole life look. And I think that really becomes interesting when you look at the type of things he was designing, not only for clothing, but for the house. Well, I think the idea of Armani broadcasting his um, spring 2007 couture live on the internet is, is very interesting because, again, it's kind of like American Gigolo. It's this whole idea of taking something niche, something exclusive, and opening it up to people, opening it up to appeal to everybody. And really, it's, I, I think that's, again, very much about opening up this closed world, um, broadcasting the name, really cementing his place in, in mass culture as well as in kind of the fashion elite. 
Armani's designing of Chelsea Football Club suits and the Italian team's Olympics outfits, there is a kind of very interesting look at the way in which sports and fashion designers kind of marry and work together. So I think designing for someone like Chelsea Football Club, again, puts, puts his designs in people's minds. In 2011, Armani had what is referred to as his blue period, uh, such as Picasso's blue period. And these blues were across the board, azure, midnight blue, navy. And it showed a real kind of inherent sophistication in terms of color palette, which shows the mark of a very fine designer. The reason Armani is so incredibly important and it's something that really gets overlooked is that Armani changed the way clothes are made. And that's such a fundamental thing that, and it's something that so few people can, can lay claim to. I think Armani's legacy is really associated with the suits and the wearing of the suit within kind of popular culture. This inherent sense of confidence wearing something that you know is impeccably thought through really appealed to people and I think it still does. One of my favourite facts about Armani is that when he has a swimming pool, the swimming pool is um, a yard wide and 50 yards long. It's the minimum amount of water you need to be able to swim the laps that Armani does, and it's a strip of water, and that's what he swims in every day. It's this whole idea of this incredibly precise, engineered lifestyle, incredibly minimalist, stripping everything away. And I think that's evident in his clothes, and it's evident in his life as well. Tonight. Tonight, and you got fixed up too. Tonight, I'm gonna show you a good thing.